Welcome to Business as Unusual for January 2022. Um, today, we're talking about New Year and new analytics, and we're joined by the fantastic Jill Quick. Hello, Jill. Hello. Um, it was lovely things lot- because everybody said nice things about me at the beginning. It's like, <laughs> No. We have had lots of um, people tweet and say how excited they are for this because you're on it. Um, and uh, now that I've met you um, a, a couple of times, I can understand why people are so excited. So, oh, um, kind of you to well, say. <laughs> Jill, is re- Jill really knows her stuff for analytics. Um, I'm going to let her do a proper introduction. But today we're just going to go through some of the mistakes that Jill um, sees in Google Analytics, and uh, I'm going to learn some new words there, I think. Um, uh, We're going to talk about data visualization and the future of analytics um, being GA4, probably, mainly. Um, Throw your questions in the chat or the Q&A. Andy will uh, pick up on those. Um, And don't wait to ask till right at the end. You'll forget. Ask as we go along. We may not answer it as we go along. We'll probably answer it at the end, but ask as we go along and we'll save them up. Um, so let's officially start with by um, uh, asking Jill, blimey, how did you get in so in depth into Google Analytics, Jill? Ooh, right. So if, if you will indulge me um, and my leaky eye, I started a new mascara today. Like that was an error this morning. Um, <laughs> so about me, what do I say? Um, so I run the colouring in department and I focus on all things to do with measurement. So analytics, data visualization, a bit more big query with GA4 now. Um, and I guess if I was to have a job title, because I work for myself, so I could call myself anything, um, I'd say analytics consultant and trainer. So um, I help brands get the most out of their measurement with training, reviews, audits, troubleshooting, consulting, that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. How I got where I am today, um, I've been in digital marketing for a very long time. I came in from a, a marketing background. So I did my GCSEs in the late 90s, because I am that old. Uh, And then I went on to do a marketing management degree and then a postgrad in in marketing. So I found my home really early on and I'm very grateful for that. So all my jobs in various different sectors being in in marketing, I lovingly adopted um, the name, the colouring in department as a company name because uh, I have, as I'm sure many of you on the call have had, the department, the marketing stuff, um, I, got, I got called it, you know, oh, Jill, she's in the marketing department. We were doing that nebulous marketing stuff and seen as the revenue takers, not the revenue makers. Um, we made things look nice, you know, send some email stuff out, get me a poster done. And I thought, you know what, fine, let's own the phrase, do the work, do the work well. Um, so doing all my marketing, feeling pretty confident. And then about 14, 15 years ago, Um, the love for analytics, the happy accident that happened. I worked in a company and the sales director was making a move for part of my marketing budget and some of my staff. Because as far as they were concerned, we were the nebulous department um, and they needed us, but they needed sales more. So it's like, well, we can justify taking that that budget. Um, And I heard a quote on my postgrad, which was the Edward Demings quote, which I've used loads, which is without data, you are just another person with an opinion. So I thought, if I'm going to go into a meeting and say, I know the work that my team are doing on social and SEO and paid media and whatever, I know it's having an impact, but I need to prove it. I need to have evidence. So I need to go to the board meeting, not with a warm, fuzzy feeling going, I think this is working. My bell is telling me this. I had to show the creative work, all of its beauty, but I also needed to show the numbers. So that started the journey into getting into the weeds of GA because if that I, mean, I think there's a meme of it of like trying to learn something and you're like I get it oh my god I don't know what I'm doing this is amazing oh my god it's terrible that's how the journey's been over the last 14 years um so I've done about 230 audits now I've trained thousands of people um, wow. and this learning journey's re-energized again because of all the GA4 stuff so um I think because I've found my home and I like it um I like the structure of it but it's also it's got this side of it that is a little bit creative and how you apply the data and the visualization. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with what I like and, and what I'm good at. I, I, it's good that, isn't it? That, that, cause the coloring department, coloring in department is, I always used to um, refer to my mate, Ryan, who's a creative director is I'll get the guy with the pens um, because, yeah. and, and you know, it, 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 it is, it, it's derogatory for the amount of brilliance that, that people with that kind of talent bring, but actually, yeah, the, the applying Google analytics data or any 
data creatively is where the is where the real kind of gold nuggets lie don't they in marketing so often so we have so many people i mean and i'm sure you see it more than us where people come to us and they say well we've been measuring all of this in analytics and um that's why we're that's why we're doing this and la 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 and you and what does it tell you oh i don't know that's just what we measure right okay should we start should we figure out what you need to measure and and what's going to help you grow the business um it's a it's a funny old thing and i'm 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 glad you got it um right my zoom is just absolutely playing up but the rest of you are having a good time by the looks of things so that's cool um uh right i am going to uh, so you were sorry i just i've I've uncrashed it so that's good i can see (laughs) um uh Jill, you, when we first spoke about doing this, you said that one of the things, or, or, or we asked actually, what were some of the common mistakes you saw, and you used the word confabulations. Tell yeah, us about some of the mistakes you saw and teach us, what, yeah, teach us what it means. Yeah, so confabulations are lies honestly told. Um, I, I think the, the word first came to me reading all of the wonderful Brene Brown stuff. Um, there's a theme for my pandemic, self-worth, Brene Brown, soothing company, <laughs> balm for my soul. Um, I was like, oh my God, that's the best way to describe all the stuff that I see in audits because you don't want to turn around to somebody. Um, so out of the 230 plus audits, I've never seen an account that's correct. There's always something that needs tweaking between the collection and configuration point. It's the boring stuff that nobody wants to do. They just want to go to the report when it spits out what it's processed. And you end up having people presenting reports and they look brilliant. And it's like, ta-da, here's the stuff. I'm like, the data's wrong. You are lying to people about the numbers that you have. But you're doing it honestly because I've never met anybody that's intentionally tried to fake the numbers. You know, we're not Boris Johnson in the government here. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, you I'm going to roll with it anyway. You're preaching to the I'm choir on this it's, call. Don't yeah. worry about that. I might, I might get some hate tweets now, but it's like, it's fine. Um, I know, but not way, from I'm, our audience, you won't. <laughs> not from our audience. I found my tribe. Um, but yeah, I think that there's this this thing about confabulations of data that I've, I've been referring to, which is the lies honestly told in your analytics that you are presenting data and you think it is correct. You think the data is solid. And actually, when you unpick it, you go, ooh, actually, this has been processed wrong, which means this, and this hasn't been done, so it means that. So it's kind of a a nicer phrase to say, there's a few things we need to tweak. You don't know what you don't know, but now let's work to fix it, get cleaner data so that you've got more more integral data to focus your decisions on. Right, right. I I I think I had an example of this this morning, actually. I think when we spoke about it, I was like, oh, you know what, we see that a lot where we had someone who was saying our ah, Facebook traffic to some particular top selling track products has absolutely dropped off a cliff week on week compared with last year. Um, and uh, some of that was they sell um, uh, 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 entertainment products. So um, some of that is because people are back at work um, and not in lockdown and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but we were looking at it and I'm like, well, there's, a, there's an awful lot of Facebook data showing up in, in paid that actually also looks like it's in just referral traffic. And then, and he'll, and then oh, that, and it, I don't know, when I was looking at it, I was thinking, how big is this problem? If, we, if you've got a problem like that, where you know that your numbers are slightly wrong, how big is that problem? Does it, does it poison the whole well? I mean, it depends. <laughs> it does depend. Uh, I love that answer. Um, it can be, um, so I've had similar problems like that where um, the tagging of a UTM parameter was incorrect so the traffic was going in the wrong bucket. For this company, it had big implication because it was a two million pound budget. So somebody was pretty pissed that the numbers didn't show what they thought it was gonna show, um, but it wasn't an in-house team doing it, it was the agency. So it was a big problem because they turned around to the agency and went, you said you knew what you were doing, it's not tracked properly. Um, let's fix it. And normally, if there's if there is an issue somewhere, when I start to uncover other things that that person or department was responsible for, you mm. can start to find other other things when you move your stones around, so to speak. So, um, so yeah, it's for some businesses it's not an issue because there was you know there's one where they're like, oh, we only spend a hundred pounds and we were just testing it. It's not a problem. Other things you can do things to your data, which we'll talk about, um, that are completely illegal. And it's like, yeah, no, that's a big problem. So I try whenever I do an audit to work through um, 
and, and have like a traffic like system in terms of, you know, have everything you can look at. And this is the same for anything, isn't it, right? Um, SEO work, email work. There's a long list that you can do, but it, it, it needs to be prioritized to go, this is red and it's on fire and we have to approach this immediately. And then the next task after that will be, you know, fix this afterwards, you amber. And then the green is like, these are the nice to have, but let's wait for that. The tendency is that people want to do the fun stuff, the exciting, sexy stuff. And you're like, no, 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 let me get you back to this critical problem over here. Um, yes. And normally they are the boring jobs that nobody wants to deal with, but they have a big impact on, on the end of the, um, the end of the work. Shall I give you some examples yeah. then? So I've got, I had, I had, we had some bullied ones because I was trying to think with, with the time that we have, um, what could I talk about? Um, so one, well, I'll talk about three actually. So there's three issues that have come up in the same, um, it, not necessarily in the same order of, of severance, of, of, of severance, is that the right word? Uh, severity, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, but equally, they were the same problem I found in the last audits I've done in the last year. One of them was looking at how your house is set up in order. So we have an account, property and a view. And I like to think about the way that you structure your GA account as a house. So your website is a home, the account is your roof, anything you do to the roof impacts the house. Your property is your website, so it's a floor. And some people have a bungalow, some people have high rise flats. Anything you do to the property will impact the windows, which are your little windows. I've got three in this room now, reporting views that you look in and see what people are doing. And you add drapes and blinds, otherwise known as filters, to alter what you see and what people are doing inside that particular property. Now, the configuration, because we all get the same stuff, lovely, isn't it? Um, it's almost like Ikea. We all get the same dimensions and metrics and the same settings, but some of us don't put our house in the right order. And one of the big problems is, and again, it sounds boring, but it's really important, is your referral exclusion list, which is at property level. So when you fix this, it impacts every single reporting view because that's the nature of the structure. So some examples of this, I did an audit for an e-commerce brand who didn't add all of their tech stack payment providers to their referral exclusion list. Now, what happened here? You, you know the issue. Um, somebody goes on the website, they buy something, they pop off to the payment gateway, it, the money's gone through, they loop back to the website uh, saying, thanks for your dosh, here's what's going to happen with your order, or maybe they've done... Um, an event, uh, they've gone to a third party tool to go, yep, you've signed up for the webinar, you've signed up to Eventbrite, something like that, loops you back to the website. If you don't add them as referral exclusions in the acquisition report, the way that Google's processing your data, it thinks that that last touch point, that last non-direct source and medium is medium referral and then source the name of the tool so you know sage or paypal or something yeah. like that and what happens is because you're it's like you being a dog like patting yourself on the back running around chasing your tail it means when you go in your acquisition reports and you go where did all of our money come from and it's like oh it all went to referral and when you dig into it i'm like it went to yourself it went to your same same source so this referral exclusion list helps identify who gets credit for the conversion. So you would go in and add these in your referral exclusion list. It essentially says, dear Google, here's a list of websites, uh, treat them as direct. And that's what happens to it. It budges them into direct. So if I go through that same process, website, loop off to buy, payment gateway, loop back again, Google then goes, not medium referral, source PayPal, uh, now direct. What was the source before then? Was it email? Was it retargeting? Was it SEO? Was it things get a little bit easier? Another problem I see is um, a lot of fragmentation in the behavior all pages report. So if acquisition problem is um, how people find your website, behavior is all sorts of reports to tell you well what did they do when they're on that website and I had a client at Christmas and they said oh we've got loads of problems with with like working out a common question that we get from the boss how many people went on said page landing page blog page campaign page whatever and he said it's taken us it's taken us days and I'm like why is it taking you days like it shouldn't take you days and he went oh and he opened up his screen for me and this fragmentation of data happens a lot because Google, maybe not so helpfully, will record the exact URL of a person session for every single unique session for every single unique person on the website. And these parameters get added uh, quite commonly. Their problem was Facebook. So you had all of these 
pages. So you went into the all pages report and there was like 20,000 rows of data. And he's like, oh my God, Ouch. like 20,000 rows of data. Not a massive website either. He's like, I don't understand. I don't understand why it's so, so bad. So we looked at it and he's like, here's the, pa- I'm going to say like forward slash blog. And he's like, here's 200 page views. And then he said he had to go through and then manually find where he found the page view because it was adding the Facebook CLID garbage at the end of yeah. it. And they were all singular page views because they're, they're unique to each person that yeah. in. So they were going in and they went, we don't know. Sorry, I'm not across from the hospital. Did you hear that? Really loud um, drama. Um, my hearing aid picks up on more things, I think, now as well. Distracting. Um, yeah, anyway, we can't hear it. Um, oh, good, good, good. Um, just, just me freaking out about my sound. Um, yeah, so this Facebook problem, um, they had it with Twitter, with LinkedIn. They had it with even common things like password resets. When somebody forgets their password and they go to forward slash password reset and then loads of gobbledygook at the Question end mark, it. yeah. Um, yeah and they were like well we don't know excel enough to do the witchcraft to kind of like get it out um so we're manually counting it and i'm like oh there is a fix for that you know um and this is done at view level so again anything you do to the account whole house and a property all of your windows anything at view level if i clean this window here the other window does not get clean so you have to do this to every single reporting view so you go into the view settings and you find exclude query parameter and you will go in and put Facebook CLID and then you'll put like Twitter. I think LinkedIn is little fat, little underscore fat, which cracks me up. I've got a bad sense of humor. Um, <laughs> but then you also want to go in and put things like maybe order IDs, maybe uh, password resets, because essentially all this setting does is it it cleans up the URL, it just scrubs off all of the stuff from that query parameter that you don't want, which would then consolidate all of those URLs to one. So we wouldn't have 20,000 rows of data individually, you'd go, the blog had this many page views, and it wouldn't be 200, it would be 490, because it's added all of them together. So that's a really common problem. And I see people undervaluing their pages because of it, because they don't go far enough to the end of the report where you have those singular page views, they do the top 20, the top 30, the top 40, and they've undervalued their pages. And some companies, their metric is how many page views do you have and how do they get there? And you've undervalued your work because you fragmented the data. So that's something that's an an easy fix once you've identified those common common issues. Um, The third one, to scare you all in the new year, Personal identifiable information, um, boring, yes. Um, would you be happy though if you got sued? No. Would you ha- be happy if you got hacked? Uh, also, no. Um, so this is definitely where, again, I've never met a client when I say, I'm really sorry, there's PII in your account. Um, nobody willingly went went and did this, right? Like they, they, it's just not something that you'd want to do. So let me explain what it is. So typically... PII, personal identifiable information, can be pushed into your GA account unknowingly by forms or LinkedIn emails of the common culprit that accidentally pull the URL with the email address in the URL. And because GA will record the URL for a user session, you can accidentally pull in PII in the URL in the page reports, which means you have processed it. Google's processed it. This is a violation of your GA terms of use. It's also a breach of the GDPR and Data Protection Act. Um, there's another issue with this as well. So there's one to go, oh my God, like, you know, we've, we've not done our terms and conditions with Google. And I've met some people that are like, screw Google, I don't care. Um, this <laughs> nice message is, um, is why you, you need to deal with this. So I had the absolute pleasure of doing some work with a client Um, that needed help with their PII and we needed to uh, remove it. I will give you a rough breakdown of how you go about removing it. Um, And I was working with the lovely CMO, the Google Tag Manager anointed God that shares all of his knowledge. Um, And I'll share a link actually um, for the show notes for this so that um, people can go off and and see what they do. So I'm paraphrasing what he told me just to like really um, make sure my client took this seriously. He's like, you never allow personal identifiable information in the URL, Jill. And I'm like, yes, no, I understand that. And he said, well, Another reason for the GA bit that I didn't quite appreciate is that from the URL, it will leak to vendors who use the page URL as a value adding parameter like Google Analytics. And it will also leak 
HTTP referrer string to any third parties that receive HTTP requests from the page, even if the browser truncates and refers the value to origin. So essentially doing this, not only does Google capture it, you basically opened a back door to your house to go, anybody want to come in and steal some data? Here's oh something my that goodness. you can do and you're willingly passing this out. And this, this is what I don't get about the dark web. Like some people, I don't know why you'd want to attack websites and do it, but they do it, they exist and they do it for profit. So this is something that you really need to, to focus on. So his advice when you've identified which URLs are causing you the problems. He said, if you were using um, forms that collect sensitive information, name, address, that kind of thing, email address, whatever, um, make sure the form is sent with post rather than get, and that will mitigate that risk of loading sensitive information. Um, and obviously, you know, it's, it's something that you'd, you'd need to speak to Dev about. I've honestly seen examples where somebody's used a plugin and they've used a third party tech tool and didn't realize that this was the impact of it. So I think sometimes, you know, you you do things again, confabulations, you, you, you're doing it honestly, you're, you're lying to yourself if you're doing it. Um, so my advice is you first need to look to see if you have any PII in your analytics. And a quick way to do that is to go into your all pages report and then where you've got your dimensions and metrics and you've got like a little search bar, Put yeah. the at sign and hit search. And you'll need to go through different date ranges because it could be a legacy thing. It could be a new thing. And then yeah. you'll start to see, hopefully, no tears on your dashboard. Um, if you start seeing URLs with, with email addresses, I've seen it with password IDs. I've seen it with telephone oh. numbers. Like, you name it, I'm looking at it going, oh, my, <laughs> this <laughs> needs to be burnt with fire. Um, <laughs> it's quite bad. Um, I also find it sometimes in event data. So if you've got any events firing, um, like on forms, you're tracking them, yeah. check the action and label of your event. Same thing, go in, go in the, the search bar, click the app, see what you've got. Yeah. If you have found that you have PII in your analytics account, you need to isolate where it's coming from. Uh, the URL should give you an indication. So the last one that I did, I'm like, it's this activation page, it's a welcome email, and it was a sales form. So we could go back to IT and go, hello, IT, um, job for you. Could you rework how this form has, has, has been made so we don't leak this information um, across the World Wide Web and potentially get, get hacked? Um, but then you also have to go through the process of finding the data in GA and asking Google to delete it. Right. And this is a bit of a boring job, but essentially, once you've found it, you can build a segment, a session segment to say, find a page that contains at and go to your audience user explorer report that shows all of your client IDs. And then yeah. with that segment, you're basically saying, show me all of the client IDs that have the PII in them. And then yeah. you export it, it's boring as hell, um, but it's a job that needs to be done. Export it into your Excel document, put it into a master list, dedupe it because you can have the same client ID in, in different times. Um, and then I, I make it sound easy. Just write a little script to Google's API and say, here is the naughty list, please delete yeah. it. Um, it's a couple of hours work. It's not, not terrible. You just need to know the process to do it. Again, yeah. I'll send you a link for where you need to go if, if you need to have a look at that. Um, the other option, is burn it with fire, which is there's a setting at property level called data deletion requests. Some people might yeah. have seen it and thought, didn't know why, why is that there? Um, if you can't isolate the client IDs, then it's a bit of a blunt tool this because it, it, it can't isolate which client IDs, which pages have the PII in them. So you would essentially say all of 2018, the URLs, um, they all get deleted. And I have had that where there was a case that was so bad. I'm like, we need to delete all of the data, which meant we had to export data, obviously with the segment to say, don't include the PII. You don't want to yeah. repopulate the problem somewhere else. Um, so that they had some legacy data to work with later. Um, and then we just deleted it. GA4, which I know we'll talk about later, it's a much easier solution. Their property level, you can just say, hey, find any any at signs in the URL, just delete those URLs. So it's a cleaner kind of okay. way of, of doing it. But the the way that most people are doing it at the moment, um, there's big problems. So in terms of like the to-do list, my first point when I find PII is go to the source, the technology you're using, if it was a third party and flag it to them. Yeah. Um, one was a well-known um, 
shopping platform. I think they fixed it now, but I found a lot of clients and I was like, this is a common thread. Um, <laughs> and then if you've got any forms speaking to developers or agencies, and again, I think people build something and don't know, it's almost like that T-shaped marketeer. You're so into your, your depth of your subject matter you don't realize the causal impact of an action that you've done somewhere yeah. along the line. Um, so it's almost like those paired metrics almost, but you don't realize that you're connected. Um, so yeah, so you need to kind of get it fixed. I mean, it, it's helpful to know these things. Um, again, I've never met anybody that willingly wanted to break the law and, and open a back door for somebody to hack their website, um, but it's, it's useful information. Um, to know anyway we'll talk about something jolly in a second because that's a bit <laughs> heavy we're not going to talk about PII again <laughs> really, really useful though and really useful to 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 think about and particularly for those of us who are in agencies on the on the on the call or for people who have multiple websites to go right well at least um particularly when um uh, as uh, Jill says we'll share the show notes we'll put them out on an email in the next couple of days so you'll get all the links to this stuff um but having a bit of a process to one identify if you've got a problem and then see if you can fix it like with a little bit of surgery and as you say if you can't fix it with surgery then you have to have that hard conversation about burning it with fire yeah um, which and particular and, and again that i really i'm really glad you said about making sure you take what data you can and even if you make it live somewhere else in in excel at least you've got something so you can do that historic data um comparison which is kind of what we were talking about and we're going to get onto ga4 later but that's one of the things that that was at the back of my mind from what you said about ga4 so i'm looking forward to to covering that um uh, the, uh, the you we we also talked about data visualization and how to how to maybe it's tell stories a bit more with data. I mean, hey, you're the coloring in department. You know, yeah. you know what I mean by that. Um, what what can you can you share some of the ways in which you yeah, would I, like to see that done more often? I mean, where where I get to work with the client um, more long term, it's always lovely to do. The audit side to go collection configuration here's your problems how to fix it then training and helping them work with the data and get something out of it and then building the report because that's why we're using analytics in the first place you want to report at the end of the day to do something um <laughs> unfortunately we get what i lovingly call number soup it's like here you go here's some stuff and i'm like i don't know what i'm looking at and then you send it around the teams and and i think like we obviously can't get away from the fact that we have to report on our work. Um, yeah. So we create Tragically. reports. And I honestly think that sometimes the charts and the lines and, and the, the going up and the down, it's a way to tangibilize the work that we do. Because I think there's a lot in marketing, the arty side of it, the craft that we do. Um, there's not always an output. So the charts and the graphs kind of go, this is the time spent kind of thing. Um, and I honestly think that part of my marketing soul anyway dies a little bit um, every time a report is not read no action is made or worse you've spent days hours months weeks whatever building a report and then somebody just looks at it and goes mm, that looks interesting and that's <laughs> it and you're like what 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 I've just spent lots of time on that um <laughs> so what's really important for me is to is to create dashboards that visualize data in a meaningful way but help to visualize the impact of the company's objectives. And there is a process that you can work through to kind of start and finish a blank sheet of paper or blank Excel, blank day studio to get something a little bit better. Um, so for me, there's, there's obviously three things that we need to think about. One is the data. So is it clean? Is it valid? It's not breaking the law. It's not, not confabulated with all those fragmentations. Like it's as good as it can be. And you're pretty yeah. confident about the data that you're using. Because um, without that, we haven't got anything. You then need to have an idea of how you're going to visualize it um, so it's clear and concise. And then you need to think of a way of how are you going to structure those visuals in the narrative using those visuals and context to, to do what you want them to do. And for me, this is where user experience comes into play. Um, there is a limit to how much the eye and the brain can process information. We know all this from the stuff that we do about copywriting and, and writing successfully for the web and building products yet we ignore all of that when we're doing our own internal work in a company or as an agency presenting stuff to your clients and we want to reduce the cognitive load of our dashboards and people should look at it and get it quickly so we have to remember that you're not building the dashboard for you 
you are building it for somebody else. And I have to say that that has been the hardest thing to train my brain to do. I used to do loads of reports in my career and I was really proud of them. I'm like, ta-da, look at my fancy dashboard. Um, <laughs> and looking back, they were complete number suit. I got it. Some of yeah. my team got it. But when I presented it to anybody else, they were like, don't really know what I'm what I'm looking at or what's the point in this. Oh, this is Jill's way of tangibilizing that the coloring in department is doing something. Um, and either way, if you are going to do a report, the whole point is you need to get an action because that is the whole point. Somebody needs to take something away or approve something. Like, otherwise, why are you doing it? So my, my formula that I use, and I've, I've got this as a PDF that I'll share um, later, I go through a number of questions. So I'll do this with my clients. I do this with my students. And if people don't answer these questions properly, I, I don't play. So the first one is, what is the point of the report? Like, we shouldn't be creating reports for the sake of creating reports. So the goal here is to make decisions based on the report, not for the sake of reporting. Very tempting to throw everything together and make it look pretty. Um, we don't want to just go, stuff happened. So what is it that you're trying to say? Um, what questions are you trying to find an answer in the business or for the stakeholder? So you could be doing something like, um, we've just hired an agency to do loads of social for us. So we want to highlight some specific KPIs to show the growth in social traffic and the impact that that's had for our sales and the company. Knowing that from the starting point is like, okay, there's a reason why I need to get out of bed today and do this to-do list and do it properly. The second question comes around who is getting the report? So just like having the idea of a persona, and I don't really like personas, I like customer empathy, Matt, but we'll use the language persona for, for the sake of this. Think about having reporting personas. So who's getting the report? What do they want? What sort of person are they? And that gives you an idea about how much information to give these people and allows you to highlight the metrics that matter to them. So if you're presenting to the CEO, he might want just really high level numbers like sales, return on investment, conversion rate. And they're like, job done. Thank you very much, Jill. Head of marketing, though, might want to know how many users did we get from the website and which mm. marketing channels? And can you give me a breakdown of conversion rate by channel? You give that to the CEO and it's like, why are you giving me this? You're going way too deep, high level numbers. And you've got to remember as well. And this was a hard one for me to learn that there's really only one or two people that can ultimately act or confirm the next steps of the report. And that's how you work out out of everybody that gets the report. Yes, we all want a little badge to say we're important, but really there's one or two that really are the important ones. What is the action you want them to take when they get that report? Should they go, yes, you still have your budget, dear agency, carry on. Do you want somebody to go, yes, you can have some money to go and do that campaign? Do you want somebody to say, yes, carry on with your work, hire a new person? You need to know what that outcome is meant to be when you're sending that report. Once you've got that nailed, you can start thinking about the key messages. So the person that's getting the report, what is the main thing you want them to know or understand about what you're doing? So could it be that your budget's under pressure, so you want to show the return on ad spend uh, of a campaign and highlight that you found an opportunity to move budget from one campaign to another, and that's what you're doing. So remembering that there's always one to two people that can do that action helps you understand what are the data points that I want this person to really focus on. And then we can think about how we can make that message easy for them. So I'm sure you've all heard of Steve Krugs. I'm sure you've got the book somewhere in the office. Don't make me think. It's a nice little wee book. It's little and diddy and very good to kind of get into user experience. Um, he's got that thing that's like, don't make me think. If I'm looking at the report and I start asking questions about the data, you have failed in how you've built that data. Somebody should look at it and go, got it. So how can you visualize the data in a simple way that doesn't get them asking questions? You know, you're not unclear about anything. And there's ways that you can use certain data types to reduce that cognitive load. So one thing that I like to do is if I've got lots of data, I might use um, heat maps as a way of doing things or bar charts or something and put it in a hierarchy left to right because it's logical of how we look at things. And yeah. let's say I am presenting the data to a particular person and I know the metrics that they care about. I will grayscale all of the metrics and only color in the things that I want to pop out. So when they look at the screen, it's a bit like bolding fixing points on copy that they can look at it and go, 
wow, that's a lot of sales for social media because I've highlighted that copy. Corporate colors, if you want to, you can have your own color scheme for how you're going to design what you're going to be doing and the hierarchy of the metrics that you're doing. And something else that really bugs me when I see lots of templates, I mean, they're a great starting point on like Data Studio. There's never any bloody headings. <laughs> it's like, here's a chart. And I'm like, of what? Um, what am I looking at? So nice, plain English titles. There's nothing wrong with going, how many people came to this website from organic? Not everybody that's looking at the data knows what you're showing them. So nice, yeah. clear um, headings. You know, you can change the size of your metrics to a header one, header two, header three kind of approach. We can do all of this. And the final piece to this, this process is from doing um, my old life as well, I used to teach a, a digital marketing course. It was a 10 week program and we had a UX module on it. And I, I think I did about 11 or 12 instances of this. Um, so hello to any form students. Um, we did in this user experience module, it really got me to think about using UX in other things, not to do with website pages and email templates. So I started to apply the application of wireframing and wireframe a report before I started to build it. Because it's so easy to adjust the wireframe and get the wireframe signed off and then go and build it. And yeah. it's honestly, just sketching out that first draft, it doesn't have to be fancy, post-it notes, pens, I use pieces of paper and scribble, send it to the person and go, is this what you're after? Yeah, but I want that number and that's not very clear. And, and then it also means when I've loaded up Data Studio or I've loaded up, um, like Excel, it's not scary blank space. I'm like, I need this dimension. I need this report. So building it gets a lot faster. The hard bit is when you spend days building a report and then you get asked to do amends and you're like, that was 10 yeah. days work in total. Do a wireframe first. Um, and then it gets a lot easier when when you want to build that report and, and things get a little bit more joyful, dare I say. <laughs> Particularly after the uh, the earlier rant about fractional uh, fractionalized data or fragmented, excuse me, data yeah, and fragmented um, data, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah that's really cool. Um, uh, the, you're 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 going to share, uh, uh, and I should it bears repeating for the people who've joined. Um, it, it, Jill's going to share um, some uh, links to places where you can go and find useful uh, topics to go and do further reading or further learning on this stuff. Um, so when she's rushing through this stuff, and that's not me saying you're rushing at all, Jill, but sometimes oh, no, I I, when you're lending it one ear and you're doing your emails over here. Time. Yeah, exactly. And I can imagine people like doing their emails thinking, oh, I missed that. That's the, that's the bit I tuned in for and I've missed it. So don't worry, there's going to be a watch again and you can um, uh, follow some uh, links that Jill's going to share with us. Um, uh, in fact, I'm going to stick one in the um, uh, chat now because the resources page on your website at the colouring in department is just fab. It's got loads of really useful stuff. Um, so I'm putting that in there now just in case anybody needs to leave before we get to the end and start doing adverts about follow Jill on this and go visit her website. Um, uh, we, so we've got data viz and I really love your idea of I also love the fact that you kind of object to the term buyer personas. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm legally obliged not to say that I object to that because we're a HubSpot partner agency and I can actually be burned by the men in orange robes if I say that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I kind of, it's 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 getting a bit tired. It's, it's just because they're, they're so one dimensional. I think there's something that was on Twitter that had, is it Prince Charles yeah. and Led Zeppelin? And I'm like, they have the same characteristics. Uh, my we have a thing in, in the resources, which is there's something called the consumer cross stitch that we, we built, which layers uh, the customer empathy map, stages of awareness, and your kind of query parameters. And then you could, they all align really nicely. So the think and feel part of an empathy map, all the, I call it the washing machine of the brain, like all the secrets you type into Google, because um, nobody's going to know. Google will never tell you if you're like, I mean, my son does it all the time, but especially homeschooling. My wheel, what's this? Google, what is a fractionoid? <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to admit that I don't know. So I'll Google it. Um, and that's all the thinking and feeling and what's going on in my head. Um, but they're also very much the who, what, when, where, why question. So that's all your blog content. So yeah. moving beyond, this is Jill, she's 39, she lives in Kingston, she has two children. It's like, write me some user-friendly user, user -friendly content 
it's too flat. You need to know more about me. What do I see in my life? What do I hear? What influences me? Like yeah. it's beautiful when you you almost take the persona and pop it up into a into a 3D character. Yeah. Um, is much more useful. But yes, there are there are still very um, you know, when I've taught at some universities, I still have to use personas, but then I have yeah. to tell the students like just ignore this and this is yeah. what you do in a job job. This is what you yeah, have to write exactly. to get your exam results. Um yeah, or you, or you, um, or you, or you have to use them and uh, because that's what everybody does. But actually, this is the way that you make them useful. This is the way you give them some flavour. And, you know, yeah. you approach the pain and or, or identify their pain and find out who they want to be rather than, you know, what shop they go to to buy their shopping. That's not so useful as what their pain is and who do they want to be tomorrow and who do they want to be next year. Um, uh, but I love using, I love the idea of using that for creating reports because I've been I've been I, I, I've been the person who's created some fucking terrible personas <laughs> um, 10 15 years ago good god they were useless um but then also um uh, 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 I've created some really useless reports so just the, combining <laughs> you you've you've nailed it for me there with uh think about yeah. who it's for and, and it's all like it, do you want it's those them? affirmations isn't it that it's not that you've done something wrong this is a learning journey like i have this as like a little mantra like it's always a learning journey so when i started to learn this it was just having a bit more emotional intelligence to go okay jill we're on a learning journey let's look at the reports that you did how could i make this better oh look there's no title oh look there's no hierarchy oh look i've done a pie chart and we're terrible at identifying pie charts for their scale so yeah. let's change that and it's just full things to kind of make things better and it's it's really joyful when you then get um somebody responding to go i understood what you were presenting like there's no there was no drama and yeah. I know we've all been in a report as well I know I'm not the only person that, that's identified this when I show too much information somebody in the room gets obsessed with the wrong metric and the oh, entire God. room we've lost them like oh yeah. what's that bounce rate don't look at that we're looking at this over here and they're like no yeah. Mike you've caught my eye magpie like let's go over here and you're like oh God the whole meeting's derailed which is why it's important to just really think about um what you're doing anyway yeah i agreed um andy's flagged it to us um i i, I could see it coming i suspect we're, we're gonna we might not have time for many questions but that's good because i did say get them in early you haven't got them in early so we've been chatting unless once again i've missed all the questions rolling by but i don't think i have so okay talk to us GA4. about about ga4 because i'm 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 a bit terrified by it um oh, so yeah i mean tell us tell us why yeah it's so I mean, I, th I thought about like, what, what do I share today in, in, the, in the time that we have? And, you know, there's no slides and, and you, you're just doing it by the power of voice. Um, one thing that I will share is the, is the analogy of where we're going to give you an idea of the, the journey you have ahead of you. Um, so I like to think of analytics as a mode of transportation. So when analytics first came to pass, for those of you that remember 2005, Google bought Urchin and Urchin Analytics UA uh, became the first version of Google Analytics. So if analytics was a mode of transportation, then it would have been a bike. And we were all delighted because I remember, I'm old enough to have worked on websites where we had a little ticker for page views and we thought it was amazing. And then Google turned in and we were like, holy smokes, this is pretty special. Um, rolled into 2007 and Google were like, uh, we, we've got you a present, uh, an upgrade, here's a moped. And our classic <laughs> analytics was born. Um, and we loved it because we're like, oh, it's so much faster. It has an engine, like amazing. Um, but we only got so far, you got a bit tired with the data and if it rained, you got soaked to the moon. Um, <laughs> so in 2012, circa 2012, Google made some massive changes and we got our universal analytics and this is the car of analytics. So this is our GA3, the third version. And apart from them going and creating a GA360 product. So if I have a standard Ford car, the 360s had the, the Porsches and, and the fancy bits because they had the six figures to, to buy it. Um, so we've had pretty much, because it's now 2022, we've had the car for nearly 10 years. And in tech land, that's actually quite old when you think about it. Yeah. Um, and even though I know there's a lot of people that are like, I hate it, I hate GA3, I'm like, 
Universal doesn't like anything from the first time I looked at it. The interface has changed, the, but it was such a subtle change over the last 10 years. You didn't notice it. What we've got now with this fourth version, GA4, uh, it's nothing like the car. I, I kind of disagree with the language of being an upgrade because an upgrade is I'm taking your car, I'm giving you a Tesla. I'm like, upgrade. Um, GA4 is a completely different data model to the to the car. So mm. it is essentially, we're not even on a road anymore. It's a helicopter. So we all now need to learn how to fly a helicopter. So the approach of, well, I, I, I like my car, Jill, and I don't want it to change. Hard truth, 10 years old, um, Google's not putting any money into it anymore. So it's not going to be service, no MOT. This car is going to start to break down. It's not going to work. It will eventually ground to a halt. All the money's going into the helicopter. Now, if you're going to learn how to fly a helicopter or drive a car, um, you need to get a license. So in my head, uh, there's the theory side and then there's the practical side. So the theory side is where you learn about the theory and the doing and the thinking. And then the practical side is rolling up your sleeves and then going, right, we're going to we're going to like build the events and, and do what we need to do. So what I've created is, is something called the helicopter method, uh, which is the navigation plan to break down how to approach GA4 in phases. I'm going to talk you through those um, because I think that kind of the, the feeling you get with GA4, it's a mix of, oh my God, this is really exciting and wonderful with complete fear and dread. And you can feel two <laughs> things at the same time, um, but it's still a bit of a panic and time is moving forward. So this is going to, to change. Um, and when I've got a massive to-do list, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm a lot calmer when it's broken down into nice bite-sized pieces and I know what I'm doing and when I'm doing it. You don't have to cook the whole thing in one go. So if we're looking at phase one, so they keep talking GA about um, dual tagging. So getting GA4 ready, but still using the car. So the helicopter's on the ground, still driving your car. So the key objective of phase one is to set up and activate the basic configuration. So we're talking about adding the configuration code to get exactly what you get out of the tier, nothing fancy. You just got the enhanced event. So that's going to track things like YouTube videos if they're embedded or file downloads. Nice and simple. And at the end of that stage, you should have a basic setup, like core configuration version one done. At this early stage, it's an opportunity from the learning side to understand the difference between how UA and GA4 work in terms of their data model. What I'm finding um, from a lot of people is when, when they do look at the data from the car and the helicopter, they go, apples for apples, it's not apples for apples. I'm like, well, it's not going to be apples for apples. It's a car and a helicopter. So <laughs> it's um, apples for oranges. It's not going to match. Your users and sessions are not going to match. The default channel groupings are not the same. They're better in GA4. So that won't match what you have in, in, in um, Universal. The way that they calculate sessions is different. I like it. Um, in Universal, it will count a new session if I have like, I don't know, I come off email and then I go on Google Ads. Because I've had two different sources, it, it triggers two different sessions. That doesn't happen in GA4. So your Absolutely. session count might be a little bit lower. Um, but we've, we've all been used to these fluffy numbers. So there's, yeah. there's a difference that we need to learn and, and, and get used to because this, this is happening. Once you've got that baseline, and, and for timelines, uh, my measurement friends, um, given the time that we have, and I know we haven't got enough time to go through everything, I will whiz through this quickly, um, I would want to get phase one done by October 2022, because that is then two years since GA4 has been about, and there's a lot of things going on in the analytics place that I think will accelerate the use of GA4 a little bit faster. Those of you right. that have used Google Ads and Google Search Console, do you remember when you had your old version and your new version? And then after a while, Google went, uh-uh, new version only. This is going to happen. This is going to happen with, with GA. How, when, don't know. Um, but I know some 360 customers that have been telling me that they can opt out of GA4 this year, but not next year. So that tells me 2023, something's happening. Um, I can yeah. visually see 2023. It's not that, like, it's, it's not like 2020 where you're like, we've got ages. It's like the pandemic warped time has made it hard. So we do phase one. Uh, phase two quickly is you will look at what you get out of the box and go, oh, my model, my, my business model, my um, website, 
needs a few extras. So that's where you'd go, right, we need to build some additional events. So I'd start with my conversion goal. So do I need to create an event for form submission? Do you have e-commerce? Then you're going to have to build um, the data layer for um, e-commerce. You can use the data layer for enhanced e-commerce in UA and piggyback off that data layer in GA4, but it's still a job to do that and there's still resources to work in there. Once you've got phase one and two done, so core configuration, then you've souped it up to customize it to your website, couple of months worth of data, phase three is where you start to compare and review those reports. So you're using it alongside your UA reporting. And there are some reports in GA4 that only exist in Analytics 360, or they're not even available in the paid version. And I cannot understand why you wouldn't want to use that knowledge. Like something that came out last week, which will get you excited. In GA4, we can build audiences and audiences can be used for segments and comparison, but can also be used for your paid media. You can add event count. So you could say, show me people who bought twice in the past week and spent more than the average order value. And it'll Ooh. go, ta-da, here's 100 people. Super, I'm going to buy an audience and say, dear Google, can I have more people that do this? And they'll go, sure, give us your money, we'll do it. Sweet, we can use that alongside the car. But I can't do that in the car. The car doesn't do it. It's not a freaking helicopter. So you're starting to use and, you know, get the best out of it. Uh, phase four is where you fine tune that setup. So this, for some of my clients, we're talking nine, 12 months into the journey of GA4 because people don't really know what they want, really, truthfully, until they're working in it. So I've got clients that we did the customization, they've got the forms, and then they'll go, oh, I'd like to answer this question, or we need to build an event for that. Let's do that. Or Google announces a new feature. Oh, should we put that on the roadmap? Yes or no? So this is where... At stage four, the teams are getting a bit more confident with the reports. They're using the analysis hub. They're building bespoke reports like funnels. With funnels, we can add time, like how long does it take people in minutes, days, hours to do the thing you want them to do? We've got path analysis. So pick an endpoint and show me the journey of how they got there. Freaking amazing. Um, but you need to set up the, the phase one and two to get to that journey. Like you can't yeah. be building these reports until you've done that configuration. And it is not as simple as going tick upgrade and then ta-da, it's done. You need to do something with the collection and configuration. Because I know we're short on time and Andy's probably going to start shouting. I haven't got the chat for that reason, so I can't see any hate. <laughs> <laughs> You're okay. You're okay. He's too enthralled. He's too enthralled. Thanks, Andy. Um, the last phase is big query. So some of you might be like, big query? Some, uh, not many people even know what that is. Think of big query as the black box to your helicopter. So it's going to store everything, all of your raw data. It's all going to be populated into that black box. Now, you can set up a GA4 big query export for free. They're allowing us to do it for free. This has normally been a paid thing, you know, 360 customers and people with money. Now, yeah. you may think, well, I don't really think I'm going to be using um, big query, Jill. I'm like, actually, I think the, the learning journeys of marketeers over the next two to five years is going to understand, write a brief or do the implementation of a big query analysis because... When we look at the data retention of GA4, if you're on the free version, we get 14 months. If you're on the 360 paid version, you get 50 months. So when you get to the point of wanting to do historical analysis in GA4, you can only go back in those exploration reports for 14 months. So then you're going to have to go into BigQuery to get the previous month. So help out future John by setting it up today so the data is there ready. And there's also some other little things which um, you'll need to know about with GA4, where all of the event parameters and their values for your auto enhanced and recommended events, I'll send you a link for all of this, um, they will populate in the analysis hub. But anything outside of that, you need to publish as a custom definition, which is the most unsensical language in the world. But you'll right. need to do that for things like um, keyword data because that isn't in that list. So if you're doing paid media, you might need to publish them. If you want right. to limit, that's where BigQuery comes in again, because it's your black box and it's got everything. So I think we're kind of moving towards, uh, we're all flying in a sky like the Jetsons. It's all exciting. We can do things that we didn't do before. 
we're all going to have to think about how we migrate over. Um, and if you've got some people that are thinking, like, as I said, it, it's a journey, right? So um, we, we've got a, we've got work to do. Um, if people are saying, oh, oh, this sounds like a lot of work, you're like, I, I don't know if I want to do it. Cool beans. My question for you then is, um, which analytics platform are you migrating to? Because if you're not <laughs> going to move over to GA4, the car is going to break down. So the, the phase one, two, three, four, five will still be applicable to whatever it is. So we are moving towards us paying micro payments to access our analytics. The 2005 Urchin free analytics for all is going out the window. Like Google wants to make more money. Google's Google. Like yeah. they, they've got enough money. But yeah, I'll end it on that. Um, but I've got a whole link of this measurement that I'll send on um, on my site. So um, I've got more detail um, in this. But I would implore you, you've already started the theory of phase one just by listening to what we've done today. Um, at least have a look at it. Like just look at the demo yeah. account and, and get it on your radar because it's coming whether you like it or not. So we need to start planning and you do not want to be in the position where you aren't dual tagging and have some historical data waiting for you for when you know the car eventually stops working. You want to start planning for that now. Yeah, because you're not going to be able to carry that old data from mm -mm. classic to Make GA4. The are different, exactly. So it's just like, here's your old car. You can go in and have a look and see, you know, the lights might turn on and stuff will be working. Um, I mean, even if for like most businesses, do it for your own website. If there's any agencies on, do your own website, go through this process yeah. with your own website and then be like, right, I understand this a bit more. So you can confidently talk to your clients. Um, and then yeah. if you're in-house, go talk to your agencies and ask them what to do. <laughs> and, if, and if neither of those things work for you, you can do what we're going to do, which I just haven't got around to, even though I emailed Jill about it before Christmas, which is hire Jill to come in and train you. Yeah, or you can hire me. Shameless thing. plug there, but thanks, John. Yeah, well, you didn't do it. I did it. Because um, I'm, I'm already, we're, we're already bought into that. I just, we just need to find the time now. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it, it, I, 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 you can talk to Jill about how much it costs. Um, I think it's a great investment, certainly for anybody who's in an agency and certainly for anybody who is working on a website and a company that's turning over. If you're turning over much more than a million quid, then you really need to speak to Jill about getting this set up properly. And you need to do it soon because I know yeah. she books up about two to three months in advance. So you've got to move fast. But don't get in before me, please. Um, we have got some <laughs> questions. Are you OK to overrun by about 10 minutes, Jill? Yeah, yeah. Cool. I find um, my children with um, a dinner after school. I'm like, don't come in the house. Go to McDonald's. Have a happy day. <laughs> so, yeah, you can carry on. That's brilliant. You should drive, do the same thing tomorrow, but don't do this. Just chill out. <laughs> have a bath. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, I'm going to go through the questions that we've got here. Oh, so um, uh, uh, Dibs, who did make it, thanks for coming, Dibs. Um, say, uh, anybody who doesn't know, Dibs used to work at Noise Little Monkey and used to run these sessions. Um, so it's nice to have her here. She's saying that, yes, she's going to have to use GA4 and um, uh, uh, classic Google Analytics um, for, the, for the foreseeable future while she gets her head around GA4. I think we've kind of answered that. That's right, right? But that's the point, like you are, you're not getting rid of the car, even though Google Analytics, they've changed their messaging to say, GA4 should be your primary analytic solution. I'm saying, put a pin in that, carry on using the car, fine tune the car, make sure the car's not illegal, get the best out of it, build GA4 and start to run it alongside. When you get to phase four, you should be using GA4 as your main source and UA as the secondary when yeah. you get to phase four. But for me, most businesses, I'm like, yeah, let's just get you on phase one and then yeah. let's do some customization in phase two. Let's see the fun stuff, all the freaking amazing stuff you can do, and then you know start to switch it over. But you can even do um, simple things, Claire, like um, slowly introduce the concept of new numbers. So because GA4 is event and user scoped, you don't get all the session data that you used to get. If you've got reports to clients that are all session, 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 sessions, start off with going users, sessions. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. Do, do little things to kind of gently ease that that journey. Um, but I think when you're looking at the comparisons, as I said, between the car and the helicopter, because of the way that the, the, the engines work, the data models are different, it's, it's not as simple as to go, it's going to be a complete clone. And that's why when you log in, most people kind of open up and go, ah, 
can't run away close the laptop yeah. and get out of the room yeah. they're like nope not for me um and I'm like yeah no because it, it's the helicopter dashboard it's different so you can't expect it to be like UA I've 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 made my terms with that. I wasn't happy when this came out. I'm like, it was in the middle of a pandemic. I'm teaching my children. I'm like, people read the screen. <laughs> now is not the time. Now is not the time. We're busy. <laughs> We're surviving. Um, so yeah, it's um be gentle with yourself, go in phases, you know, that kind of thing. Cool. Um, so we got a couple of questions from Twitter. Um uh, this might be what we were talking earlier about that uh, thing where you get the question where it's quite deep consultancy where you need to know about the person's business. Oh, right, yeah. If it is, we can skip past it. Um, uh, how can I configure roll up account view to accommodate 200 plus domains? Right. So for those that haven't heard of that term before, um, this is Google Analytics 360 customers uh, only. Right where if you have lots of different properties and sources of data, you can get them all rolled up into one place. Um, so you can have a high level view of what's happening. So you're not having um, a house with all the layers and layers and layers. It's like a massive skyscraper. You're almost making it a very flat structure where you, you're bundling everything together. Um, so the example for this with, with 200 website, excellent question. Um, something that's come up a few times with other GA4 consultants and uh, companies that I know that are using 360. Well, what I can say is that 360 GA4 is beta at the moment. They announced it at the end of last year. I think it was in the autumn. Right. And I still can't find the documentation that says, well, how do I do roll-up reporting in GA4? So a bit of a cop-out question. Um, I would speak to the GA4 360 sales team and go, hello, what's in the package because the stuff that I've looked at it, it's been a bit vague it's not given me the exact details um I mean there are differences like some good differences between the paid and the and the free um you get more event parameters um I mean the sample data is, is tiny because you can have a billion events in paid uh, 360 I think it's like 10 million which is still incredibly large for uh, what we're doing um a common thing that maybe more um, useful um, if you have a cross domain tracking or multiple sites so shop.website website.com that kind of thing yeah you can still do the cross domain tracking in GA form same rules apply for that um, I have found because it is still for me it, it's still a playground to, to play with I found that when I tried to add more than one data stream, so getting up to about eight or nine, it started to fall over a little bit for me. So I don't think it's it's the case of saying, here's 200 properties, create 200 GA4 properties. I don't think it would it would handle that. So yeah. there must be something in 360. So uh, go speak to the people at 360 and be like, hello, here's loads of cash. What do we do um, if you're going to migrate from 360 to beta GA 360? Um, I think on that question as well, he, he asked about annotations as well, didn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't. <laughs> sad, ah. sad. And I'm, I'm, I'm gutted because I love an annotation. I think they're fabulous. The best oh, option man. for me to get around this is if I've used a BigQuery to export the data from GA4 into Google Sheets, I then old fashioned added a comment in Google Sheets. It's not ideal, um, but it's the fastest way for me to do it. And if you are in GA4, at the bottom right, there's a little feedback button. I'm always typing stuff in. Join me in typing stuff in and go, can we have annotations? Why does we this report do this? We want annotations. We want annotations. We want annotations. Yeah, they will listen. Um, but if you're going to be silent, they won't know. So they're not mind readers. So abuse it kindly. Um, but go into that um, the feedback section in GA4. Like one thing, and it's not being mentioned, um, there's no conversion rates for your your data and I'm like that's great having event counts Google flexible conversions galore um we're not going to get away from the fact that everybody especially paid media people are going to want to know a percentage so yeah. that is apparently on the road map for it but there's got to be a way for them to go you had 200 events firing for a file download and I'm like and what's that as a conversion point don't make me do math do the math for me like <laughs> You know, you did it in the car. Why can't you do it with a helicopter? Just do do the math. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I've been doing. So, yeah, lovely. And then we've got a couple from um, Anna, who's um, also put in the chat that um, she annotates uh, 
the reports in her data studio to make up for the fact that she can't annotate in GA4, oh, yeah. which which we like, which we like a lot. Yeah. Um, a lot of love in the room. Um, there is, a, yes, but also a lot of hate in the room for no annotations is a bad, it's a bad move. Um, so uh, Anna asks, um, are there any best practice, practices for naming conventions for event parameters to avoid duplicating stuff when parameters already exist? Right. So Oh, if I understand this correct, uh, correctly. So when when you have your events and your event parameters, I'm, I'm guessing this is when you're creating an event from an event um, or creating a custom event. So yeah. if I'm, this is where it gets a little bit meta in GA4, you can create an event from an event. So there's an event, I'll do an easy one. Um, event name click, which is for all outbound links. And then the parameter could be link URL and the value would be the URL that you just sent somebody off. So you'll okay. have an event count to say 200 clicks and maybe you wanted to create a new event for, so I've got an Udemy course, shameless plug, on my site. So I might want to create a new event for the people that go off to Udemy. So my structure is I start the event name and this could also, I guess, be done by the parameters by taking the name of the person or the event that I've taken from. So click, I would start my new event with that name and then go underscore Udemy. So I know yeah. mentally I've made this event from an event from the event name click. With yeah. the parameters, I would stick with the recommended list that Google have given us. And they've given us that for a reason because it's going to pre-populate reports in our um, in our in our system and I like this because it is going to standardize stuff like there's no longer going to be um event data in the car oh god it's like whatever you feel like labeling it like it can vary between business to business it's going to be nice to know that every single account is going to have the same structure the same name convention that's going to be mm -hmm. lovely so if you're creating some different parameters I would borrow from what already exists and then if you are creating something new try and build a hierarchy so you know where you took it from makes sense yeah. i should really have this on a screen but um yeah that's how i've been doing it so i'm not just looking at stuff going where did i take that from how did i build that configuration yeah oh yes anna yes lovely yeah so that's, that's <laughs> yeah. what i've been doing that and works. documentation is your friend log everything put it in an excel sheet like because people won't know what you've been doing so it's useful to have, I mean, you should have this with your UA, you should have some documentation to explain what you're doing, but it, it's not normally there because I don't care enough with analytics. Final question from uh, the wonderful Anna. Big query, um, do these need to be set up for each client or is there likely to be an agency type set up for them? So at the moment, um, with BigQuery, I've been getting the client to create it because wow. handing over, I have a BigQuery account and if I create it with somebody else, then it lives in my account and it, transferring ownership can be a right ball. Like it's, a, it's like this with all Google yeah. products though, isn't it? If you build a reporting yeah. data studio, try and do the handover and, and you own it. If somebody leaves, it gets deleted. So I, I give them kind guidance and I ask the client to, to create it so that they have the billing, that they have it. I'm sure that there's probably some clients that will, you know, I mean, these are all going to be new services, right? The agencies are going to have to be presenting in the coming yeah. years to go, it's going to be um, GA4. It's all going to be big query. So yeah, like get them to do it. Or if you're going to do it, you own it, but then you've kind of locked them in then because you, you own it. So, yeah, and that always feels a bit, um, a bit underhand to unethical. me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like it's just it's one of those classic. Oh, I know a bit more than you. So if I hold on to this, then when you've discovered that I'm I'm not very good, or you've just decided that you want to change the way you do things, it makes it difficult to do. You know, you have to charge. I can charge you lots of money. So yeah, I think the way you do it makes makes sense until they do it so that we can nest accounts perhaps in in a in an admin yeah. account. But yeah. <laughs> That'll be a while, I suspect. Brilliant. Jill, That you've absolutely smashed it, mate. Um, uh, I've learned so much. 
Um, and I've yeah, and I'm also so excited to go and fiddle around with GA4 now, um, uh, uh, and just like at a very high level, just so that I can have a look at the helicopter. And I hope um, everybody else on the call has done that. We are over. I'm sure everybody's got work to do. Um, uh, thank you so much for for all your preparation, all your knowledge, and helping us run over a little bit as well, Jill. Um, I hope your kids make it back from McDonald's soon. Um, thank you so much. Um, and we'll say goodbye.